So at this point, uh, if you look in the network folder, you will see the work that we ended up with last time. There's my code so far. If you want to go to the network folder, pouch start with uh, Tuesday's date. If you want a copy of that, that's where I ended up with. I'm going to copy that to my flash drive and I will work with it. So our project at the moment is just uh, the two libraries, the jQuery and then the pouch file 5.3.1 and then our HTML file. So we're we're consolidating everything, the HTML structure and the JavaScript code. We're keeping in all of that in one file just to keep it all neat together when we eventually integrate this because the end result of this we will integrate it directly into our project. It'll be fully functional when we're done with it. We'll add it to our project. It should work pretty much as is from this file into our into our main app and then it will have the, the database ability for our app. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and open up our pouch practice file in Notepad. And just to remind ourselves what it looks like so far, let's run it. Remember, uh, we're having a good result running this in, uh, in Chrome. So I'm going to continue to run this in Chrome. <clears throat> it seems that sometimes, especially in a testing environment, uh, some browser works better than others. And uh, when it's actually live on a real server or in an app, it works as it's supposed to, but I noticed that when we were working with, for example, jQuery Mobile the first few days, sometimes the jQuery Mobile would just keep spinning and spinning and spinning and it would never load up. That's because we had an online resource that our web browser was, you know, nagging us about that it didn't want to connect to. And then when we were looking at this in Firefox, I didn't quite like the console as much as Chrome, so that's why we're, we're just using it here. So I will open up my console so open up that file just to look at it. Console shouldn't be any trouble. And if I go look at the resources, remember we've got in Chrome, yours might be hidden or not, but mine is in the double arrow. I need to access the resources, the resources of this project. And so here's where we're seeing the cookies and everything being stored and our database, which is deep down an indexed DB type of database. And if you open that, you should have the, your pouch file, your pouch database. But it's empty because this uh, data does stay permanently, except if you restart the computer with, with decrease, right? Except if you uninstall the project, except if you, de if you delete your app. So the data is permanent, uh, but for us, of course, this all got deleted the data in the database because of deep freeze. Now, notice the database gets gets created right away as soon as we run it. The web browser creates the database. The cool thing about our code is where we've got uh, new pouch DB. It's programmed in a way that it's smart enough that if there's no database, it will create a database. But if there is a database, it'll just access the existent database. And so we got it to the point where if we go back to console view we can put stuff here so just to quickly test it I'll just put you know a, a, a save class and I get the visual uh, the visual feedback for the user class save and then for us in the developer in the console we get um, object OK. So we did save it to the database. And that other output at the top is just some quick raw output that it saw what was in those three fields. And then it saw that we grouped it all together into an object. And there it is all grouped together as an object. The ID, the title, and the instructor fields. It was properly saved to the database. And uh, it cleared our fields so that we can enter a new class. That was a little bit of that uh, function there to clear our fields with good input. 
And then again, just to test this, B class, save. And I've saved class B. Good. And then if I want to save class B again, save that class, document update conflict. There's some sort of error there because I'm trying to reuse the same CRN, which is the unique ID. Every document in our database has a unique ID, and only one can have that in the whole database. So I'm trying to put in, again, another BB class. Even though I changed title and instructor, I'm still using the same unique ID. Since it already exists, the error comes out here. 409, message document update conflict, which just means, oh, you must be trying to update this document. You did it wrong. No, that's not what I meant. I was trying to save a class that already existed, so it didn't give me that kind of error, such as, you know, document already exists. It assumes we're trying to update an existent document. That's why it gives us that error. And we will be able to update documents, of course, update data in the database, but it needs a little bit of a setup, and we'll, we'll get to that today. And uh, what else did we do? Oh, we did the, uh, okay, let's say I want to reset that. Show class, we click on that, and then it does show us in the console that so far there are two rows, there are two, you know, two records in the database, class A, class B, two items in the array. And if we open up that object to further appear inside of it, we've got offset rows, total rows. And uh, within the row is the actual data. Now, if you recall, when I forced that error message to appear, if I want to save class BB again, and it says document update <coughs> conflict. That's coming from the message field of this of this output here, and we did that via error dot message. We were able to retrieve the value of this key with error dot message. In a sense, we're going to do something similar here. Where, it's, where we're saying, okay, there's this is our database, we've got all of this data in these rows, we're going to pull out through the row, you know, object 0, which will be our first class A, A, or object 99, which will be some other class, so we will be able to access the actual data from the database by referencing its row in the database. <coughs> So if you get back to our code, beginning line 53 is where we'll, is where we'll continue our show classes part. So here, just uh, before we do that, um, we're going to uh, take a quick detour. Uh, any questions uh, so far? Um, you know, we're st we just started it and such, but uh, anything maybe pops into your head from last time? Any burning questions? Okay, so we will continue here. Um, quick refresh here. Show classes. So once the BTN show classes button is clicked, run the function show classes. Here, show classes. And we started the process right here. There is a method, all docs. Because we can pull out a document. We can pull out data from the database one document at a time. No, we want all the documents. We want to show all, everything in our database, every, all of the classes we've saved. We've got all docs. A couple of options here, include docs true, so give me all the data of the document. Without that, it would only give you the ID, which would just be the class CRN. Alphabetize that, ascending, true. It's going to be class 001, up to 99, 2000, whatever. And then that gives us a callback with either an error or a result. And then just the very last thing we did was, OK, show that console output. Give me the result, which was that that we see here, that just raw output of the whole database. So what we will do is we're going to take that data and process it, because it's, it's spitting out all the raw data in JSON format my two classes or 20 classes or whatever. And so I need to process that data. Let's go back to our code here. I will um, 
add a, a new line after console log. So I am leaving all of these console outputs, which might be giving us a sort of a, a messy console. You can obviously comment all of that out. But I'll leave it for the moment. What I want to do next is um, I want to take this data that's that's uh, that's coming back and I want to process it. So what I'll do here is we'll say we'll run a function show table of classes. I want to create a table, a literal HTML table on screen to display my data. Now if you've been around uh, web design a while, you know that there's tables, the HTML table tag to create rows and columns of things, right? This is a table, rows and columns. And if you have been around H uh, web design in a while, for a while, you might remember that uh, we would cheat and use tables for design. If we wanted to place things on a specific parts of the screen, uh, the old trick was to make a table and say, this is two columns, and on the top left column, put my logo. And then below this, another row, and on that bottom row, the footer. That was the old way of doing things because web designers were jealous of graphic designers, that they could create really cool documents on real paper and such and align things exactly perfectly. And we didn't have that in web design. There was no easy way to do that. So someone figured out, what if we make a table to divide up the screen and then place things where we want? So what I'm getting at is that tables got a bad rap because we don't use tables for that anymore. We use CSS. We use CSS to do our layout and therefore there's a generation of people growing up thinking, yeah, tables are evil. That's what, I, that's what my elders told me. But we're, we're going to use a table, but we're going to use the right tag for the right task. Remember, I've talked about that, semantic HTML, the right tag for the right task. So in my case, we are going to use a table. We're not cheating. We're not bending the rules. We're using a real table for what it's designed for, rows and columns of data. That's what my classes are, a list of rows of classes with columns of the the name of the instructor in a column of the class title and so forth. So that's why this function that we're about to run is called show table of classes. It's going to build a table based on the data we're, we're requesting. Speaking of the data that we're requesting, in this function we then have to uh, f write in here result. Now actually Result, results, exactly. We've, na we've, na we've named it result at some point and results at other point. There's no problem as long as you're consistent. Back here on line 54, I named this, uh, this parameter here result. So as long as I keep using result, this will work. If I call this results and I re referenced it down here as result, then that would not work because results is different than result. It's got a letter S. So as long as we keep these consistent, is if we misspell this, you know, R E S L L T. And as long as we keep misspelling it, it'll keep working. But what this is saying is we saw this in the console. Show the results, show all of the data in the console. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna process that data with a function called show table of classes. That means we need to define that now. So let's jump outside of the end of show classes function, line 59, and we're going to define what the show table of classes mean. So line 59, function, show table of classes, curly brace, close curly brace. Oh, actually, let's back up just a little bit. This will make us our, our work even easier here. Um, okay, what I'm showing here in the console output, like I said, simply in console, doing console log um, result gives me this, an object that has offset rows, total rows, and proto. And in the row... Um, key, it's the actual data. So actually we need to say uh, give me the results of result dot rows. 
because the actual data is in rows. You see that? This is also a key value pair. The key of offset, the value zero. The key of rows, and all of my data. The key of total rows, and two. There's two things in the database. So my code actually, we'll back up here, results.rows. <coughs> Here I'm basically specifying. Let's look at this field, this key value pair in my object, the rows of the resultant data. So we're passing that in here. We don't need to specify it. We don't need to type result.rows there because we're defining what this function can take, what parameters it can take. This can be ABC, this can be kitty cat, whatever. We're defining what it is and we're feeding into it result <coughs> dot rows. And so the way this will work is we're going to create a variable because we need to reference the placeholder on screen. Remember, we've got, we've got a placeholder right here. We've got a placeholder that currently just gives us a little bit of user feedback, but we're going to use that same div placeholder to actually build the table. So we need to reference it here with a variable. And here's something that we often see when, when tutorials are using uh, jQuery. Uh, we need a reference to this object. So this is, uh, this is very common. To, uh, to put the dollar symbol here. We've seen the dollar already before, like line 52, which is the giveaway that this is jQuery. So here we're creating a variable. And uh, it's, this is a variable that's going to be based on, on um, referencing something on screen via jQuery. So oftentimes you see a dollar right there. Equals. And here we'll say dollar Right here, we've got the jQuery selector. Something on screen, we're going to reference it, and we're going to put that object into this variable. This is like a variable that we've always used, and this would work just fine without the dollar. But oftentimes, you see the dollar when we use jQuery in the way we're about to do this. And so we've got that div hanging around on screen, right? What did we call it again? We called it div results. So this is going to be pound div results. So right here we're saying let's take that object on screen, let's find that object on screen, and then let's save it as this sort of shorthand, that placeholder. And then a semicolon at the end. We're going to build a table with our results. So we'll create another variable. Oh, just to kind of follow up what we did previously, actually. We're going to create a variable, but we'll do it the way we did it on line 25. Remember we did that? We typed var one time, define a variable, comma, define more variables, comma, define another variable, end. Instead of typing var, 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 and save those three bytes, let's do that instead. Let's back up, delete that var, and at the end of line 60, put a comma line, tab, uh, str, equals, be careful here, uh, line 60 should end with a comma, not a semicolon, I'm not done yet, I'm creating another variable, the div variable and the string variable. I'm going to put together a string of code, I'm going to build piece by piece this table, equals, and the quotes, semicolon. Now the semicolon there ends saying, okay, I'm done creating these two variables. Yes? Um, since you put a dollar sign for a div, should str have a dollar sign also? No, we're not using this one the same way. The reason we put dollar on this one is because we're using jQuery to reference something on screen and put a reference to it in this variable. 
this would work without the dollar as well. It's just that later on throughout our code, we can get a quick glance. Oh, I made that variable via jQuery. This one is a variable, plain variable that I didn't use jQuery to populate. So in other words, the dollar sign is a valid uh, uh, variable. For naming, naming variables, yes. Pretty much most characters, yes. Um, okay, so here we're going to build a string. Uh, let's back up into our quotes and we will type the table tag. Don't type its pair yet. And so a table like this thing that you sign every time you come here, this is a table. You've got uh, one row, and then the next row, and the next row. You've got columns. We can define that through HTML. So the whole thing would be the table tag. Let's say the whole thing table here, <coughs> slash table here. The whole thing's a table. So then we need to define rows, and we need to define cells, and so forth. The very first row, when you sign in here, you don't sign in to the very first row, do you? The very first row says student name, time in, time out, etc. This is the heading of the columns. So the very first row is a special row of headings. And the next rows are plain rows where you sign in. So here we're building a table. And then we're going to define the first, um, the first row. The first row, but... Um, because we're building a table and we want to reference it in jQuery, we should also give this an ID and so forth. Um, so let's back up before the ID. Let's give this border just so that we can see it. Border equals single quote, single quote, one. I would normally use a double quote, but I've got the whole thing in double quotes. So I want to put single quotes. I want to put a very simple one pixel border around this table or else it'll be invisible. After that attribute of border, let's add the attribute of an ID with single quotes again. And we will call this class table. This is a table um, for my classes. Again, single quotes. This is building the very first um, the very first piece of the table. Let's go to the next line, press enter. Then we'll type str again, and this time plus equals. Yes, I did end that line. So let's end it like that. Yes, and then we're starting a new one. Not here because I'm not creating string new again. I'm reusing string. Now the regular equals basically is take the thing on the right and put it into thing into the thing on the left. Technically, take the thing on the right, empty the thing on the left, and put the thing into it. So reset the variable every time with equals. Take the thing on the right, empty it out, and put the thing into it on the left. Plus equals is add whatever's on the right to whatever's in the variable. We talked on about that a little bit before, I believe, but here it's really, really going to make be useful for us. So we're going to add more into the variable. We're building this string of code. So in quotes, semicolon, we're going to end the table. So slash table. See, it should highlight now that it finds its pair. It is written very different than we've done previously, but it still works because what we've got is a starting tag and an ending tag. Start table, end table. So we're going to add this to that. The reason we're doing this is because in between these two pieces of bread, we're going to put the good stuff, all the toppings and the, and the pickles and, and lettuce and everything. We're going to build a sandwich out of this table. And so this is the top of the table, the bottom of the table, and in between we're going to build the rows. We're going to build the rows out of all of the data we're pulling out of the database. Let's back up and add a line in between those two buns, and now we'll fill in the toppings inside. Another string, 
plus equals quotes semicolon. And as I said, we have our very first special row. Our very first row is a heading row. So we need tr tag slash tr tag table row. Here's our first row. Here's our first row of table data. TR. Our first row. Inside the TR, again using the, the idiom of this thing, we've got a row. The very first row has he these headings. So this is a heading right here, a table heading. This is another table heading, this is another table heading, another table heading. So each of these little spaces in the table are table headings. So we'll type TH tag, table headings. That's got a pair. The first column I will use to display the CRN. So you see what I'm building is the first column. The first column is going to be the CRNs, the, the numbers of the class. Every row is going to be under the, te in, under the heading in the column of CRN. After that th, we will create another heading, pair. And in that column, we're going to display the, uh, the class name. So we'll just type class. The class name is the second column of data that we're going to show. We'll create another th for the, for the, he for the column of instructor data. One more th. This is instructor. So the start of the table, the end of the table, the very first row in the table is going to have my columns. Th table headings, the heading of a column. Uh, which is part of a row. So the first row, tr slash tr, the first table row. Okay, so um, this is eventually then going to be displayed on screen. We're not done yet, of course, but I want to see, does this display on screen yet? Go after line 63, so after the end of, the, of building the table, we need to display that on screen. And the way we will do this is via $div. We're referencing the div on screen, which is div results. And then we're saying .html, display some HTML in this div, semicolon. Which HTML? the HTML that we're building together piece by piece in the string. So we'll say str. This render that string as HTML in this div. The div on screen that we defined right here. Div results. Go ahead and save it and run it, and you'll get a very, very basic table, but let's see if we're on the right track. Click Show Classes, and what you should get is a very simple table that simply has one row, CRN class instructor. Check your console just in case that there's any errors. There's no errors. Good. And let's pause here. Did everyone get a little basic table on screen? Anyone need any help? <clears throat> All 
All right, so you see what we're doing here. We're, we're creating a table as if we had written that ourselves in the top, in the body section. We could have written that pretty much as is in the body section. That would have built a table at that moment. But here what we've done is we've dynamically created a table the moment we need it. When we clicked <coughs> the button to show classes, so far we just get a table with no data yet. We still haven't dealt with that. But we've dynamically written uh, some HTML code into the body of the document. Everyone got that? Okay, so after this row here, um, after line uh, 62, okay, we've built our first row. Let's add a new line before the end of the table. And what we need to do is, I've got two classes in my database so far, and I need to display those two classes. I need to jump through the, the data. I need to parse. I need to deal with all of the data that all docs gave me. The, one of the ways to do this, a good way to do this, is to use a for loop, F-O-R. I believe we've talked about that one. Yeah, we did on the day of the last day of last month when we when we uh, displayed all of the data in our JSON practice file with the social media icons. Remember, we wanted to display all of the social network icons. So we used a for loop to say, okay, display 0, then display 1, then display 2, then display x. So we're going to use a for loop again. Let's go here to line 63. And the basic skeleton is to type for, F-O-R, open and close um, Parentheses, space, open curly brace, close curly brace. This is a for loop. Do this for the set number of times, I suppose. You can think of that as the, as the mnemonic. Do this for the number of times I specify. Repeat this for the number of times specified. The way a for, loops, for loop works is we need to define our starting value. Uh, our ending value, how many times to repeat, and then some sort of increment usually so that it keeps doing it until we get to the limit. And so standard-wise we create a variable on the spot at this point and traditionally we use i, I believe they use that for index equals zero. I want to start on the zero with item because our, our JSON file starts, start, starts counting from zero. Our data from our database starts with zero. So I want to start with the zero with item in the database, in my class, in my case, class A. And remember, the syntax here is very specific in that we have a semicolon here in the middle of the command, space, i, less than. I currently have two items in my database, zero and one. So then I might say, okay, less than one, because it'll, it'll do this for position zero and then position one, and then eventually, you know, we go to two, and then two is too big and it stops. But we don't want to do this, right? We don't want to hard code a value, because right now we might have two classes, and then later we'll have 20 classes, and later we'll have 500 classes. So I don't want to rewrite my code here. So there's, we're, we will not put a hard value there. Instead, we will use the trick of result dot length result there basically has a list of all of the rows of our data, all two of our classes, all 20 of our classes. And the dot length value is a, is a number that says, okay, there's seven things in the database. There's two things in the database. There's 200 things in the database. So start from the zeroth one and go up to the last one, whatever it may be, length. Another semicolon there. And then we need the incrementer, i++. Because this loop starts with 0, 0 is less than 2, so do it. And then 0 plus 1 becomes 1. So then it comes back here again. Now, okay, now i is a 1. Is 1 less than 2? Yes. So do it again. And now add 1. So 1 becomes 2. And that's a 2. So now 2 is less than 2? No. So it ends and it stops. And what we're doing here in the for loop is building the rest of the table. 
for each class. So we will write str plus equals again, quotes again, semicolon, We're building another row, so tr, but we won't write its pair yet. This is the this is the fun, weird, tricky thing that we did. Remember, with the JSON file, we had to do this trick where we write a little bit of the of the hard coded HTML, and then we had to write a little bit of dynamic HTML JavaScript, and then a little bit more plain <coughs> plain HTML. So after the quote space plus space quotes end the tr because in between those trs we're going to have to write some sort of dynamic value so not in quotes because it'll be static Let's back up to the first TR part, and this time, still inside the quotes, we're going to write the TD tag, table data. Not sure why they call it table data. I would have called it something like TC, which would, I would think of as table cell, because TD is to make each individual cell. We use TH for the special first row of headings. But then every subsequent plain old cell here is a TD, table data. Again, I wish they would have called it TC, but no one had that great idea. They called it TD, table data, each next cell that's coming up. And it's ending table data over here. After the plus, add a space and another plus, because we're writing this HTML, and then we're going to write some JavaScript, and then more HTML. So we need it like that. In between those two pluses, let's write result, square brackets, i dot underscore id. Okay, so result is a reference to the data that we're getting from all docs. And now give me the zeroth position of the data. It's zero because we've said start with zero. I is zero. So this will translate to result zero. Give me the ID. Give me the ID that is there. I think at this point, we're not done yet, but I think at this point we can test it to see what this looks like. It'll probably look very weird. It's not complete yet, but let's see what it looks like, just for fun. Oh, actually, it's not with an... Just let's see here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, actually, sorry, no underscore. No underscore. That's one inconsistency that I've noticed in the latest version of Pouch. In the older version, you would put an underscore there when we want to reference the ID in HTML, but it seems like they don't use that underscore there anymore. Anyway, save it and run it. And in my case, what happens is I click Show Classes and I get the first column populated. Let me add another class, Class C. Let me save class. Let me show class. <coughs> Class C. Let me add D. Save class. Show class. It's giving me my first column of data. Now let me pull my code back up here. Yes, there's several things that could go wrong here. Be careful about your pluses and where you end your quotes and such. Result 
And again, that's no underscore there. Apparently. Save and run that. How many uh, did it work for you? Raise your hand. Okay, very cool. Anyone need any help? Okay. Here's our code so far. Mm -hmm. I refreshed it. You might not have refreshed it. You must have run the save and then refreshed it. Now to display something, you have to click show class. I have to see it. Show me what it is. So it is building on the first row. Now you haven't saved anything to your database yet, so I think it's working. I think it's yeah, okay. I didn't mean, get this thing. I didn't mean, realize it's so correct. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I just added a brand new class A. So class B.
All right, so what we've got here is um, we've built one row, and uh, our code here has iterated. It's gone from the zeroth position of my table to whatever the length of the table. I added more stuff to the to the to the database, so now length is dynamic. And then we're building that one row with that one TD, that one cell, specifically the zeroth one. Give me the ID, and the ID is what I'm typing in CRN. <coughs> I want to then build a second column and the third column. So going back here. Um, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to break this a little bit. Uh, let's go to right before the ending of slash td and press enter a couple of times on that. I just want to break it down here. This will still work exactly the same. It's just we're broken it for readability or else that would go on for a really long line. I'm breaking it up like this because now I want to build another very similar sort of result there. Um, so let's back up to, to your new line 65, and what we're going to do here is type in quotes, space, plus, space, plus. This is like this, quotes, space, plus, something, plus, space, quotes, plus, something, plus the rest. So it's sort of the same scheme. And here what we're doing is we're, we're closing the TD. That is coming back to close this TD, whereas previously the very last one here, we were borrowing it to close the first cell. But we're going to need three cells, so we're closing the first cell right here, and we're starting a new cell. Another TD. Start TD. That TD now, you see, is closed by the very last one. And then we're going to do the same sort of result trick right here. So between the two pluses, result, square brackets. Square brackets is the, is the syntax for referencing a specific position in an array, and our object is a series of data in an array, so the zero with position, the first position, the second. We're putting i here because through our first go round, i is zero. Give me the zero with id and give me the zero with dot. What do we call that field? Uh, we called it. Um, we called it. Oh, here we go. We call it id and title and inst. That's what we're displaying on screen. We're displaying result.id, result.title, result.inst, whatever we called those. So here it's result.title. So let's see if this one works. Let's save it and run this. And now we should have a second column full of the title that we typed into in the title field. Remember to click Show Classes. Oops. Hold on a second. The second one. Result title. Yes, one little one little thing here. Okay, we it's actually doc dot doc then doc title. Um, that is taking a look deeper into the internal structure.
structure of my object. Uh, object, array, rows, object, oh yeah. It's a, it's a pouch issue. Okay, so it should be doc. Now, let me explain why. When we looked at the raw object, that object has offset, rows, total rows. So that's why we had up here result.rows. So it's saying all of the rows there. Within rows, we have our zeroth object, first, second, third, etc. That's why this comes in here. That's the zeroth object, because I'm on zero at the point here. And then inside of zero, we have doc and ID. So that's why we're referencing ID right here. Give me the ID of that. Now I want to display title. Well, title is inside of doc. And inside of doc is title. ID also There's the ID. So, yeah, so it, that means we could actually then go back to doc dot underscore ID. Because ID is inside of that level. Yeah, same result. So either or, I'm just going to leave it as is, but do you see the logic of that? These levels inside of the pouch object, and the, out, the console output is telling us inside of this is this data, inside of this is this data. So there's a little level there of doc. So we have to say inside of that result, zero with position, the doc, give me its title. And that's the instructor where we typed in the title of the class. I guess what we could do to alleviate some trouble is, what if we did this? Let me just do this. What if I took it back to title, and what if up here we said dot doc? That should work. Possibly. Nope. Make that undefined dot. Okay, I guess we can't. All right, so I'm getting a, my column of CRN and my column of class. I'm getting the ID and I'm getting the title of the class. Did that work for everyone? Anyone need yeah, some help there? All right, let's check that. So along these same lines now, let's populate the third column. 
on this uh, at the end of this line I will add a new line and I will do basically the exact same sort of syntax double quotes there space plus space plus same sort of way I'm building a brand new uh, cell so that cell opened there so we're gonna close the cell again and open another cell just like that and then we're gonna display you might be able to figure it out result I dot doc dot inst because that's my third piece of data in my document. So close that TD for the previous one, doc title. Open up a new TD. And that one already closes because we've got one waiting for it down there. And then between the pluses, we'll have result, uh, whatever index, dot doc, because now we're deeper into the JSON object. And this time, dot inst. We call our cell inst. These names right here, I'm not making them up. I'm getting them from when we made them up up here, back on line 31. We created an object called class, and in it has ID, title, and hints. If we made a brand new, a brand new field, for example, notes, we can make notes colon class note. We would need a field in our form to capture the note, but that's more data we can save to the database easily. And then we can pull that note out of here, uh, or it'll, it'll pull the note automatically because of all docs. But then to display it on screen, we would need to build a new header, a new th for a new heading, and then a new td pair for the result.doc.note if we want it. Let's see at this point. There's my three columns of data. Yeah, no. definitely, yes. We'll have the ability. I misspelled the instructor's name. Let me go back and fix it. We'll be able to do that. So I'm going to add a brand new class, class E, for example. Actually, let me, let me jump down. I'm going to add class X. And then save class, show class, and now adds it there. So it keeps adding it now. This is adding it alphabetically. What if I add class 007? I added it later than class A, but it displayed it before class A. Why? It's ascending ascending true, alphabetical order, ascending true. And uh, alphabetical order has to account for numbers as well. Numbers take precedence before the letters. So numbers will appear before letters. Okay, what about if you want to get weird? What about class this? Save class, show class. Seems to put symbols after numbers but before letters. Okay, what about this? Class AAA. Wait a minute, I already have class AAA, don't I? No, no, no. It's not capital. Exactly. Uppercase, lowercase is different. Where does it display? Capital letters are displaying before lowercase letters. So there's all these little nuances again. As, a, as the developer of this app, we have to think of all of these things, cover all of these angles. Because as we've said, uh, you can't make anything foolproof because there's so many ingenious fools. And so here maybe we didn't have the idea and it's putting it in the wrong order. But it's putting it in the order that it has to define about alphabetically. Yes? Uh, it does require all objects uh, to have set structure. Like for example, like when we have uh, later, we want to add one more column, like um, hours. But we can. Does exactly. At this point, we've made our objects have three columns, basically ID, title, and inst. And if we make a brand new field, like this, we don't have to do it yet, but if we make note, we've just made a brand new field. 
to save notes. All of our previous objects will have that field set as undefined. It doesn't know what to put in it, so it'll put undefined. So we can add to the schema whenever we want. We can remove from the schema whenever we want. And maybe we got the great idea later to add, to add the note field. Well, eventually we'll add the ability to edit your note so that it no longer says undefined, and you can add a real note. But for the moment, I won't add that field yet. You see it's simply adding a brand new key value pair in JSON format. All right, so any questions so far? Does one normally build a class in this case, like a table outside of the paragraph so that it could be used? It's, uh, it's very common to do it this way that we're building the table via JavaScript because we don't need to display the table until we have data. We are going to populate the database with data and then we want to display that data on the screen so we'll build a table at that moment. There's a way to also do it that we build a table first and hide the table and then display the table and fill in each row of the table. Um, from my testing that's a little more cumbersome because here we're just going to build a table as necessary with the amount of data we currently have rather than building a table where we don't know how many rows we need and then we start to fill it with data and then we're out of rows so we have to think more about adding more rows dynamically anyway so at this point We've got the we've got the table showing up on screen. We then want to talk about uh, the other aspects of working with with a ta uh, with a, J a database. We've got create the database. We've got add <coughs> data to the database, delete data from the database, update data from the database, show data from the database. So we need to talk about deleting data and updating data. Deleting data will be easier than updating it. It won't be super hard, but we'll do deleting data first, uh, right after our break. So it's 7.07. .07. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll be back at 7.17, and we'll talk about deleting data from the database. I'll put my code as is into the data, into the folder, if you want to copy.